Truman, open up. On May 17, 1980, Harry R. Truman woke up to banging on the door of his lodge on Spirit Lake. Truman was 83 years old, but still spry. He quickly made his way downstairs, peered through the window, and grit his teeth. Ugh, not again. It was the county sheriff, William Costner. Sitting behind him on the lawn was a police helicopter. Truman opened the door a crack, just as the sheriff pointed up at Mount St. Helens, looming over the two of them, and said, This is your last chance. That volcano is going to blow. Truman looked up at the mountain, then back at the sheriff, and said, That mountain and that lake is a part of Truman, and I'm a part of it. I wouldn't leave if we couldn't drag me out of the 10-mule team. Then he shut the door, turned around, and walked back into the house. This is Home Made, an original podcast by Rocket Mortgage about the meaning of homes and what we can learn about ourselves in them. And I'm Stephanie Fu. Today, Man vs. Mountain, the legend of Harry R. Truman, and why some people refuse to evacuate their homes in the face of a natural disaster. Spirit Lake sits at the foot of Mount St. Helens in Washington State. Shirley Rosen has fond memories of visiting her Uncle Truman and Aunt Eddie at their lodge on Spirit Lake when she was a child. As a teenager, she worked summers there, tending the boats and serving meals to the visiting hunters, fishermen, and mountain climbers. I just get bubbles in my tummy. I would get so excited about going up to the lodge because Spirit Lake was so pristine. It was just beautiful. And the mountain just reflected right on the lake. It was just a very special place for me. Shirley's Uncle Truman was a character. When you were around Truman, you listened. He never quit talking. And he was smart. He was a fast talker. And uh, he had so many stories to tell. It's hard to describe. If, if you know anybody of his, of his vintage... He was very independent. Big and ornery, he didn't suffer fools, even if they were also big and ornery. Shirley once looked down from her room to see Truman in a confrontation. I heard Truman uh, cussing, and I looked out the window, and he was cussing at this big black bear that had come at, to tumble the garbage. He was in his undershorts, and he had a rake. And... Uh, he was chasing this black bear. Well, then the big black bear turned around and started chasing him. And he, it reminded me of a, one of these old-fashioned cartoons. But Shirley's uncle also had a soft spot. He was constantly teaching. He would talk about the height of the mountain and how much more beautiful it was than Mount Rainier. And he would talk about the trees and what kind of trees they were. It was more of a teaching experience than it was a... Uh, a boss experience. It was more like a a relative teaching you something that you didn't know. And he had a playful sense of humor. Well, Truman would buy cow brains when he was down in town, and and so Annie Eddie would cook them for him for breakfast. So she would fry the cow brains and butter, and he was so excited. He was like a little boy getting a, a, a new chocolate or something. And uh, he would, you know, kind of dance a little two-step and come up behind her and kind of pat her on the, on the backside and, because he was very excited that she was cooking his favorite breakfast. Truman built the lodge with his own hands in 1929. 20 years and two wives later, Aunt Eddie joined him and they ran it as a popular tourist spot. They were a happy couple. They worked hard at the lodge and shared a love of the local foothills and flowers. But then... In 1978, Aunt Eddie passed away from a heart attack. It, it was the saddest thing I've ever seen. He was just absolutely a broken man, just totally devastated. You would never expect to see Truman cry, but he couldn't quit crying when Aunt Eddie died. Truman stopped renting out rooms as he grieved her. And then shortly after, on March 20th, 1980, Mount St. Helens experienced the first in a series of small earthquakes. A week later, St. Helens belched out sulfurous gas and ash, an explosion heard throughout southwest Washington. And then a few days after that, 
seismologists noticed red-hot lava moving inside the mountain. Washington Governor Dixie Lee Ray closed the mountain to visitors, and nearby residents were told to leave. Anyone caught trespassing would get six months jail time. And this is what Shirley remembers her Uncle Truman saying to that. He said he wouldn't leave because that was his home. The mountain and the lake, there's like my arms and my legs. And if he lost his arms and his legs, he would die. But the authorities were saying that if he didn't leave, he might actually die. So why not just leave and come back? Even in the face of grave danger, why would someone stay? It turns out lots of people refuse to evacuate their homes during natural disasters. On the West Coast, as wildfires rage, before hurricanes in Texas, Louisiana, or North Carolina, or when flooding hits the Midwest. We consider it a success, actually. If we could get half the people who were under an order to evacuate, we'd consider that a success. Jennifer Horney leads the Disaster Research Center at the University of Delaware. While she thinks people should evacuate, she also says it's a normal human reaction for them to want to stay. And there are many reasons for that. Sometimes people just don't have anywhere else to go. They don't have the money. In other cases, simple things like not living close to a main road can be a deterrent. And then there's the head shrinking aspect of why people don't leave. It's tempting to diagnose and pathologize this phenomenon, so scientists say that the desire to stay is a symptom of what they call cognitive bias. Humans are very bad at risk assessment, so we tend to to make decisions to do things that we feel are risky or, or fear things that we feel are risky, which actually have a very low um, potential of occurring. So we see people being afraid of flying, um, but happy to drive when actually the risk um, of death may be higher from a car accident than from a plane crash. This poor risk assessment allows people to insist that no matter what happens, they'll be safe. People in coastal areas might think, oh, the last hurricane missed me, so this one probably will too. Another bias causes people to forget how bad the last disaster really was. And to complicate things, there's another bias that ignores risk altogether. It's called the ostrich paradox. The idea is that an ostrich uh, would rather bury its head in the sand than um, understand the, the true risks that it's facing. Um, and so I think that we do that all the time. We continue building, um, you know, homes and infrastructure in the floodplain as if if we just ignore the fact that disasters are more frequent and severe, that that will not continue in the future. While some of these factors were at play at Spirit Lake, the case for not evacuating might have been more than just willful ignorance or wishful thinking. Mountains work in mysterious ways. For starters, when Mount St. Helens reawakened, it was the first time that had happened in over 120 years. Back in 1980, modern volcanology was new. Seismologists in the area had just started using computers, so they were still unable to properly assess the situation. At the same time, there was a lot of pressure to let people go about their daily lives. And some of those people didn't like being told what to do by public health officials. So the state government flip-flopped on what to tell residents. Eventually, they decided to lock down the mountain. But that decision backfired. The trembling volcano seemed to make Mount St. Helens even more compelling. It didn't help that Truman, a successful local businessman who had lived on Spirit Lake for over 50 years, was refusing to leave. So media and tourists flocked there. Even with the National Guard deployed, it was impossible to cut off traffic. It was like people were drawn to the mountain. Where he was, uh, was an extraordinarily beautiful place. Spirit Lake was, I don't know, one of the gems of the Cascades and the forests surrounding it were magnificent. And then you have this backdrop of this beautiful peak, this symmetrical volcano with a uh, snow and ice on it. Thomas Hinckley used to teach environmental sciences at the University of Washington. He climbed Mount St. Helens before and after the eruption. He recognized it as an exceptional place, almost holy in its pristine beauty. 
and he understands people's desire to connect on a spiritual level with a natural landscape. The powerful feeling they have when they see, uh, for example, a mountain that to them is sacred and its connection gives them a sense of calm and being. Hinckley says that Truman had a relationship with his home where he wasn't a separate entity from the land. He was a part of the land. Truman first laid his eyes on Mount St. Helens in 1907 at the age of 11. He and his family were loggers, lured there from West Virginia by the promise of cheap land and a burgeoning timber industry. A few decades later, they were joined by others from back east. Many of the people in this area were independent. They didn't socialize much with anyone beyond their families or small communities. They lived off the land and had small farms. Truman's family was the same. The only time he really left the region was for a few years to serve in World War I as an airplane mechanic. But when he came back, he snowshoed into Spirit Lake. He built cabins where he could fish, hunt, and explore. He bootlegged liquor during Prohibition. And then in 1939, he built a large lodge on the lake. And over time, Truman became the respected senior member of this remote community. People looked up to him and sought his advice. Something we're increasingly recognizing is what's called traditional ecological knowledge. That is, uh, the knowledge that people who spend a long time in a place gain from that place and know that place differently, but in, in some ways, perhaps with more depth than somebody who might use scientific knowledge to examine a place. To indigenous populations, arguably the people with the most ecological knowledge, there are many stories and legends about the mountain erupting. These stories normalize volcanic activity. To them, the mountains aren't scary. They're part of the community, even when they get angry. So I think the idea that Truman felt he was part of the mountain is really critical in this sort of positioning of us versus them. But Jennifer Horney, the disaster researcher, is cautious about romanticizing some of Truman's more individualistic attitudes. There's an idea that rural people know how to help themselves and help one another because they can't rely on outsiders when there's an emergency. This distrust of outsiders might have further prevented Truman and others from believing the scientists once they came to better understand the severity of the eruption. On April 30th, 1980, geologists discovered a massive bulge, like a giant bubble, on the north side of Mount St. Helens, a sign that pressure was building inside the volcano directly above Spirit Lake. But Truman was unfazed. Here he is several days before the eruption, explaining to a reporter why he felt safe. What do you think is going to happen? On our side, the north side, just left me alone entirely. I'm on the northeast side. There's no rock, no ash, or nothing on my side. If anything is coming down, it's coming on the south side or the east side. But so far, it's done no damage, and I, uh, it don't look bad to me. Truman had spent 54 years on that mountain. He thought, how could some geologists know it better than me? And because of his status, other residents trusted him over the scientists, over Governor Dixie Lee Ray, over the government. They trusted him even more when, after the bulge appeared, the mountain went quiet, the belching stopped. But scientists knew that the bulge was continuing to grow. In those last few weeks, 1,800 residents of the communities around Mount St. Helens were successfully evacuated. And even Truman was getting a little nervous. Here's his niece, Shirley, again. He thought the mountain was going to erupt. I don't think there was any question about that. He did tell people that the earthquakes really frightened him. He was afraid. The earthquake started back up again. Truman's home started to rock and shake regularly. He sat in his lodge, looking out onto Spirit Lake, surrounded by his 16 cats and menagerie of birds, all while more and more people left the area, even the Forest Service. But sheriffs and deputies from all of the neighboring counties kept coming to try and get Truman off the mountain. Others tried to. Oh, I know he got a lot of letters from children, and I think the children's letters really touched him, trying to get him to leave. But evacuating would leave his property susceptible to more than just the mountain. Thieves were using the local service roads to access abandoned cabins. Truman kept a vigilant eye on his 100 boats and many hunting guns. 
During a standoff, Truman also received more than a few marriage proposals and became a media celebrity. He was featured on the front page of the New York Times, was profiled by Time and Newsweek, and appeared on the Today Show. His story made him a folk hero. And then he finally got what he wanted. After two months standing firm at Spirit Lake, Governor Dixie Lee Ray sent him a letter granting him permission to stay put. Here's Shirley reading part of the letter. Your independence and straightforwardness is a fine example for all of us, particularly for senior citizens. When everyone else involved in the Mount St. Helens eruption appeared to be overcome by all the excitement, you stuck to what you knew and what common experience and sense told you. Shirley really wanted to visit Truman, but in early May, the state finally signed an emergency order to create a red zone around the mountain. We were really worried. I wanted to go so bad, so I wrote him a letter. I wrote him this long letter telling him how much I appreciated that he did for me as a child with all of these memories of different things that he taught me. I was kind of an introvert when I was in school. I was a middle child and our father had deserted us. And so Truman took on that role in my life. And I could just hear him saying, you could do it, kid. You can do it, kid. Shirley's sister Elaine decided to take her chances. She convinced the authorities to let her through the roadblock so she could visit Truman. She brought him a pot roast and a bottle of Shenley whiskey, his favorites. He took the Shenley and put it under the cupboard because he said these damned earthquakes, you know, he says, I can't tell what's going on half the time and I want to make sure I have my faculty. So he, he totally quit drinking during the time of the eruption. Elaine tried to spend the night hoping she might convince Truman to leave with her in the morning, but Truman wouldn't budge. Shirley remembers what he told her sister. Jesus Christ, the state knows I'm here. The government knows I'm here. Everybody knows I'm here. Why, if anything happened and any emergency came, there'd be the goddamnedest line of helicopters sitting out here. They'd jerk me off here in three minutes. You know that. So Elaine left. And then on May 17th, Sheriff Costner made one last visit. Truman, open up. But flew away on his chopper without Truman. We had a major eruption occurring at 8.32 approximately this morning on Mount St. Helens. Emergency procedures have been put into effect. The explosion was 500 times stronger than the Hiroshima atomic bomb and three times more powerful than the worst case scenario predicted by scientists. It was on a scale and to an extent that you just could not imagine. Pulverized trees further out, it knocked all the trees over. Further out, it knocked all the branches off standing trees. This is Thomas Hinckley again, the environmental sciences professor. It was now this gray landscape, no green, uh, no colors other than brown and all sorts of uh, shades of, of, of gray and uh, go, merging almost with white. The north flank of the mountain completely collapsed. Mudslides quickly started forming because the volcanic blast wasn't just a vertical eruption. Scientists had not predicted that it would also be horizontal. That's what the bulge was trying to tell them. So it destroyed everything around it and traveled thousands of miles in all directions. And then let's see, the next thing would be a series of pyroclastic eruptions. This is hot volcanic material that flows flowed out of this new crater and it flowed down and hit Spirit Lake. When search and rescue finally got to Spirit Lake, they found that it was emptied out by the eruption, like a bathtub that had spilled out over its edges. They located the abandoned mine shaft Truman had fashioned into a shelter, but it was vacant. Everything else was gone. The lodge was gone. The trees, the boats, the cats. When we heard that Mount St. Helens had erupted, my first thought was I knew exactly what he was doing. Every morning he would get up and sweep that porch. Every morning when I, I would be up in the crow's nest and the first thing I would hear was the Nickelodeon and he would play Bubbles in the Wine by Lawrence Welk. And Truman himself was nowhere to be found. Vanished. It was like he'd been swallowed up by the mountain.
In the end, I wonder if Truman really didn't believe the scientists, if he really thought he was going to be safe, or if he knew of the risks. I might not myself want to abandon a place like that because of the hold it would have on me. And maybe a, the idea that if you abandoned it and it was destroyed, then what would you do? Maybe Truman knew that Spirit Lake might be vaporized. Maybe he knew the trees might be flattened. But maybe he wanted what we all want. A good death at home, surrounded by the ones we love and the ones who love us. For him, that might have been the white pines and Douglas firs and falcons and loons. So rather than give up his independence and move to a suburb somewhere for the rest of his life, he chose to go down with the ship. I think that's very true. I really think if he had lived to see the devastation now, he would have been so lost. You know, he lost my aunt up there, and then he lost the mountain and the lake. And I think he, I, I think he would have died from that loss. For a long while after the eruption, the mountain was barren and desolate. But 40 years have healed it. Spirit Lake is different than what it once was. It's shallower, for one thing, but because it's shallower, it's also much warmer. It has bigger insects and more fish than it did before. Rainbow trout thrive there. In fact, most species have returned to the mountain. Once again, it has welcomed its inhabitants back home. And Harry R. Truman is still very much part of the landscape, much like the volcanic lava that sits underfoot. Decades later, there's a trail along the lake called the Truman Trail, and a story has become a folktale. There are even folk songs about him. The odd movie, too. The man and the mountain are often mentioned in the same breath. That's what he would have wanted. You've been listening to Home Made by Rocket Mortgage. You can reach us at rocketmortgage.com slash homemade. You can find Shirley Rosen's book about her uncle called Truman of St. Helens, The Man and His Mountain, in our show notes. My name is Stephanie Fu. Thanks for listening. Equal Housing Lender, licensed in all 50 states. NMLSConsumerAccess.org, number 3030.